Welcome back. This is the 24th episode of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Last time we were talking about uh, the historical developments uh, that happened around Kant. Uh, we took a look at Kant and Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, and I presented Nietzsche as one of the great prophets. I'm using that in the Old Testament sense of a prophet of uh, the meaning crisis, and we talked about uh, uh, a, a, a way of understanding what Nietzsche is saying, how it's not just simply atheism. And we also took a look at a, a way in which Nietzsche doesn't really adequately give us uh, a response to the meaning crisis, although he indicates that an important project within the response to the meaning crisis is how to we reappropriate from the axial legacy the idea of radical self-transcendence uh, within a secular scientific uh, worldview. Now I want to go back to Kant and trace out a, another important line of development that's going to be crucial for understanding the meaning crisis, and that's the line that comes uh, from Kant and to Hegel. Um, I can't go through all the various uh, important German thinkers like Fichte and Schelling, but I want to talk a lot about Hegel because of the tremendous impact uh, Hegel has had on uh, the political landscape and the cultural landscape surrounding the meaning crisis. And as we know, Kant also had a deep influence on the Romantics, who also have a significant impact on Hegel. So if you remember, Kant has this model of the way the mind is framing reality in order to produce what is rational within it, and that this was then taken by uh, the Romantics and, and reversed in an, uh, in an interesting way, that the closer you got to the actual contact, reestablishing the contact with reality, the more you're reversing this process of rationalization and you're coming into contact with reality via more irrational states of mind. And what Kant had, of course, is the idea that reality out here was the thing in itself, which we cannot directly interact with. We can only interact with uh, our experience. You see how the, the disconnection from the world becomes radicalized in Kant. And all the meaning is totally within a self-enclosed activity, a self-constructed, uh, self-constructing, self-enclosed activity of the mind. right? And the thing in here, the thing in itself is nothing that we can come into rational contact with. And that's why, of course, as I said, the Romantics propose this radical idea, sort of the exact opposite of the actual revolution, that by moving into more irrational states, we can reestablish contact with reality. Now, Hegel um, is aware of both the Romantic response and the Kantian framework. And talking about Hegel is, oh my gosh. Uh, Hegel is a, a titanic and complex and difficult thinker. And so once again, I want to remind everybody that I'm trying to uh, cut through a lot of material, um, in, trying to, to zero in on those aspects of Hegel's thought that are, I think, directly relevant to understanding the genealogy of the meaning crisis. So what Hegel says, first of all, is that this idea makes no sense. Hegel points out that the thing in itself is completely unknowable. And for something to be completely unknowable, he argues, is indistinguishable from it being non-existent. If there, if there is nothing that can possibly be known about it, right, then we should stop thinking about it as something that exists, something that should be taken into account when we're talking about a relationship to reality. And if you remove the thing in itself, then you get this idea, that reality is totally found within this structure. This is, of course, a form of idealism, which has nothing to do with pursuing ideal. Idealism is the idea that reality is ultimately constructed, made by the mind in some fashion. And so Hegel makes the famous claim that the real is the rational, that this rational stuff and reality are actually identical. If you get rid of this side of the equation, the thing in itself, 
all you're left with is this, that reality is the rational. The real is the rational, and the rational is the real. And this, of course, is um, an important derivation, I think is the correct way of putting it, from the original insight from Parmenides that we saw uh, exemplified in Plato, that there's a deep connection between being and being known, that there's a deep connection between our, our sensing something as real, and I don't mean just physically sensing, I mean making sense, our sensing something as real and how intelligible it is to us, how knowable it is to us. And uh, Pearl, in his book, um, uh, Thinking Being, uh, the classical tradition of metaphysics, just does a fantastic job at explaining um, how profoundly fecund um, this idea has been for us. So Hegel takes that Platonic inspiration and he, he weds it to a critique of the thing in itself and then we get this idea that what's, what's going on actually is not just, not that the mind like in Kant is making the structures of rational experience of reality. No, no, you get that the mind is actually making the structures of reality itself. Well, what about the irrational stuff that the Romantics were talking about? Well, Hegel sort of re-understands and reinterprets these developmentally. He understands uh, the irrational aspects of the mind, right, not as us moving towards the contact with the unknowable thing in itself. Instead, the irrational aspects of the mind are actually a potential within the mind, a developmental potential for rationality. So the idea is uh, our, our rational intelligible experience it has not fully developed, has not been fully self-actualized, and you can hear the Aristotelian aspects in Hegel's thought. Now when I start talking about mind in this way and rationality, we have to be very careful. Um, we're not talking about mind um, in the sense that's your mind, the individual mind. We're talking about mind in an extended sense. We're talking about the entire system of patterns of intelligibility that are at work in humanity. All of the patterns of intelligibility that we're using to make sense in this profound way. So if you think about this room, for example, and my mind is structuring my experience, and then if you give Hegel, his critique of Kant, that there's nothing beyond the structuring of experience, then you have the idea that this is all, in sense, in a, in, a, in a deeply metaphysical sense, this is all the activity of these patterns of intelligibility. The patterns of intelligibility and reality are this, is this mind in this extended sense. So try to think of these patterns of intelligibility as structuring reality, not just the experience of reality, and that they form a living system. They're developing, like an Aristotle, it's like a living thing. They're, they're going through a process of self-actualization. The irrational elements are constantly being transformed into more rational, intelligible elements. So the Germans have a great word for all of this, the word Geist. And like all German words, it doesn't translate that readily into English. It covers these two words that we separate in English, and it overlaps between them, mind and spirit. Because what it's trying to pick up on are, again, this living systems of patterns of intelligibility by which we ultimately make sense. And given this argument against a re an unknowable reality being a reality, then the patterns by making sense are identical to the patterns by which reality is intelligibly structured. So this is an individual idealism. This is what's going to become known as absolute idealism. Because the absolute is another term that's used for this system of self-realization of the patterns of intelligibility, rather than talking about an individual mind. I'm trying not to get too abstract here, but it's hard not to be abstract when you're talking about uh, Hegel's idealism. 
And so my task with you is to try and explain this in a way that constantly makes it plausible to you and also at least viable so you can see why it became an attractive way of thinking. If you deeply buy Kant and the Romantics and yet you accept Hegel's argument against this, you reinterpret the Romantics the way he did, you get this position. How do you study it? How do you understand it? How do you study this living systems of patterns of intelligibility that structure experience and reality? Well, you study history. And here you can see, of course, the deep influence of Christianity and going back to the Axial Revolution within ancient Israel about understanding history as the process by which reality and our understanding of reality are co-unfolding together. So you study history and you look for patterns in right, the history. What are you looking, what kind of patterns? Right? These are patterns in how we have systematically made sense how cultures have created worldviews, ways of making sense, ways in which we have, as I've often used the, uh, the metaphor, we've created grammars by which we make sense of ourselves and the world. So you can see some of the influence of Hegel on some of the terms and ideas that I've been using as we've been in, uh, engaging in our historical analysis. Okay, so these are patterns we realize. And I want to really pick up on the double meaning of this word, like right, I've indicated before, when realizing means here both that it is something we experience, but it is also a way in which things are being made real, coming into realness, coming into reality in a developmental sense. So, we're talking about looking at history to discover the development of this grammar of intelligibility, this grammar of, of human thinking, human being, human living, how humans are like, worlding, how they're creating worlds of, um, of intelligible patterns in which we can act in a meaningfully, meaningful manner and understand ourselves, the world, and each other. And what you discover, Hegel said, is if you look at this history, you, you see it's not static. You can see that it is going through a developmental process. And that development is driven by sort of two opposing movements or forces. One is a process of differentiation. So think about when you're trying to make sense. What do you have to do often, right? You have to grasp the differences between things. You have to distinguish. You have to clarify. You have to contrast. So what, a good way of thinking about this is this term we used, articulation. Articulation means to speak and to make sense, but it also means to find all the joints, find the division points between things. So part of what we're doing, right, is when we're trying to make sense, we're engaging in a process of differentiation, articulation. But of course, we also are doing the other, right? We are doing integration. Right? We are gathering things together so that we have systematic connections are being realized. Again, it's, we're, not, we're becoming aware of them, but we're also constituting them and making them. And again, not as individuals, but as participants, right, in this project of how the patterns of intelligibility are working themselves out through our thought, through our behavior, through our ways of living and being in the world. So, Hegel understands the process of uh, understanding as uh, the creation of a, a system, a systematization. 
Because when I'm doing this, when I'm differentiating things and also integrating them together, I'm putting them into a systematic relationship. And so let me give you an analogy, right, for, uh, for uh, understanding Hegel. Please remember it's an analogy. So when you study child development, you can see children have ways of making sense of the world, and that discloses the world to them in a certain way, and that way in which they make sense works for them. It gives them a certain understanding. But what happens as you go through stages of development is that that system gets incredibly improved. Things that were often confused together get differentiated apart and then get reintegrated so that you get a more sophisticated systematic understanding of the world. And again, when I say this understanding, you have to understand that it means, right, not just in your head, but how the world is structured for you. So, you've got this living system of patterns of intelligibility, and you see across history that it's always being articulated by differentiation and then being integrated into a systematic way of understanding being, and not just being, but how the world is being to us. So Hegel thought he saw this internal development in Geist, that this is his name, as I said, for this ex notion of an, the extended mind, right? It, was, it, it had an internal development much like a living thing, much like a child, right? So what, what do you see happening? What you'll see in the, in the history of ideas as we try to make sense of things, you'll see an idea is proposed, a particular idea, a way of understanding, and it gets contrasted, right? It gets clarified, it gets distinguished, it gets differentiated from a counter-idea. But then what typically happens, right, is that these two ideas then are drawn together into a higher integration. Now, this is often popularly explained. Hegel doesn't actually use these terms this way. Uh, but this is often explained by this idea of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Right. So the idea is, you get an idea, you'll get a counter idea, it's integrated together, and then this serves as a new idea to start the whole process again. Here's the counter idea, right? And then that gets integrated and so on and so forth. And what you have is the increasing articulation and integration of the patterns of intelligibility, which for Hegel, given the argument, are also the patterns of realness, the patterns of reality. You get this incredible complexification. You get emerging capacities for understanding and being in the world. He calls this process dialectic. Right. So, just give a quick example from the history of ideas. Right. You have people who are trying to right, get at what is reality, what kind of thing is reality, and you'll have certain people uh, like Parmenides and Plato and saying, well, being, right, for, for things to be is ultimately for thing, right, reality is changeless. Because when I know something, I know it to be true, and for things to be true, right, it has to be that that's the way they really are, and if they're changing and I try to know them, I can't ever get a true grasp of them, and you get this idea that reality is changeless, right? And then you get people like Heraclitus and others saying, no, no, if you do that, then the whole capacity uh, for understanding, understanding your experience of reality, that things are changing, if you 
if you write off all that experience as an illusion, then there's no content to your experience. There's nothing actually that you're having an experience about. In fact, they, they argue the opposite, that reality is pure change. So you got Parmenides, right, and an aspect of Plato, and then you got Heraclitus. Now, to be real is to be unchanging. No, to be real is to be changing. Right? And you know, you can see this where people in our culture, they'll talk about reality as if it's eternity, but they'll also talk about there's nothing as real as change itself, that reality is always in process. And then Plato comes along, as we've seen, and proposes a, a way of integrating them together. And what he says is, no, that there are eternal patterns, right, and they, right, structurally organize changing processes, and if you remember that maps on to this is more having to do with the upper world, uh, the more real world, and this is the more illusory world. And you can see this played out in our science. What do you, and you say, what do you mean, John? Well, science is built around the idea that there are these eternal patterns, laws, and yet they constrain and interact with forces, which are defined completely in how they change things. And so science, right, is a synthesis out of these two ways of trying to understand reality. Okay? and it ultimately goes back to Plato. And we, and we use math to talk about this, and we use experiments to talk about this, and, and so forth. Okay, so this is not a ridiculous idea that Hegel has. It's a profound idea. You can see at, it at work. And if you talk about something, to use, I think, a strong analogy, about how science is progressing, and something about the patterns that science discovers are also the patterns of reality, then you have something strongly analogous to how how Hegel is thinking of Geist. So this dialectic, even the term that Hegel uses, by the way, this is inspired by Plato, although I think Hegel's interpretation of dialectic is very different from Plato's. But this whole process of, of the way in which Geist is historically developing is a process of self-transcendence on Geist's part, emergence. It's the way in which Geist is developing, self-actualizing, the way in which it is moving from a more and more irrational making sense to a more and more rational, systematic making sense. So, Hegel proposes that in the history of dialectic, we can get to a stage where the system of understanding and realization becomes aware of itself. That one of the things, the, one of the ideas, one of the systems of making sense that emerges is this idea itself. And you see what that means? And, and, and there's, 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 there's hubris in Hegel here, right? Because what Hegel's basically saying is his philosophy is the philosophy in which this process of Geist and realization has become a, reflectively aware of it, in which this, pro, this process ha, has created a systematic understanding that grasps the dialectical principles of Geist. When you get that, then you have what he calls right, absolute spirit, absolute Geist. There's this telos, there's this goal in this whole process. All of history is moving, and of course, he now sees himself as the discoverer of this, but all of history is moving to this moment of absolute idealism. So, rationality is seen as a systematic process in the self-development of Geist, of its self-understanding. Now, many of you are probably finding that this is a very impersonal way of talking about mind and meaning, and we will come back to that. So, hold on to that. We will come back to that. 
So when the process of making sense, of understanding, passes into this stage of self-understanding, when the process creates systems of ideas that grasp this pattern of dialectic, then Hegel says that what's happened is we have moved from understanding with a capital U because it's not individual understanding, but the understanding in Geist, to reason with a capital R. Right. So, what does he mean by that? This, the, the principles of rationally making sense, this living system of principles for rationally making sense moves from understanding things to understanding everything systematically all the things are getting integrated into a systematic understanding, and that systematic understanding is now self-reflective. It includes and refers and grasps itself. In a very deep sense, rationality has realized itself. It's a very powerful way of thinking. Now put this all together with the original and crucial premise of idealism. Right? If this is a process by which reality realizes itself and the real is the rational, this is also a process by which reality realizes itself. Right? This process at work in, in and through us and in and through history, by which reality and rationality have right, realized themselves, is God. You see what Hegel's done? He's taken, again, as I've mentioned, this right, Hebrew Christian idea that God is right, that process by which we make sense and we develop and create the world with God, and he has created a philosophical understanding of that, and had translated that religious way of talking about history into a completely secular philosophical way of talking about history. He has secularized and rationalized the Hebraic, the Hebraic heritage. Now this is important, right? Because this God is, in, uh, in ma many senses, right, a secularized, non-religious God. This is not a God that is right, intervening in history through prophets. This is a God who has been realized through the reflective actions, the contemplation of a philosopher. Hegel. Hegel understood his project in very religious terms. But, and this is a very important but, he was always translating those religious terms into philosophical conceptual terms of rational development. He would consistently take the religious terms and go through this kind of translation this kind of exposition and explication and explanation that would transform them into philosophical, conceptual theories of how rationality, intelligibility, and reality have co-developed together. So, um, I'm going to read you a quote from the earliest system program of German idealism. He states the following, quote, Here I shall discuss an idea which, as far as I know, has not occurred to anyone else. We must have a new mythology. Notice the word he's using. Notice he's using that word in a way that resonates how we've been using the word mythology in this lecture series. We must have a new mythology. But this mythology must be in the service of the ideas. Okay. 
Notice that language. It must be in the service of the ideas. It must be a mythology of reason, capital R, reason. It must be about this. He goes on to say, quote, In the end, enlightened and unenlightened must clasp hands. Right? The, the philosophical and the mythological, the enlightened and the unenlightened. Notice the language, enlightened. Right? must clasp hands. Mythology must become philosophy in order to make the people rational, and philosophy must become mythological in order to make philosophy, uh, sorry, in order to make philosophers sensible. Notice that this is simultaneously a philosophical proposal and a social cultural program for how to transform religion, people, and the role of philosophy within that transformation. He then goes on to say that this will lead to a, quote, higher spirit sent from heaven must found the new religion, right, among us. It will be the last and greatest work of mankind. This is the final utopia. This is the culmination. This will be the last religion. This will be the last thing because all of this results in this final stage in which Geist Pattern, this living system of patterns of intelligibility and how reality itself is structured has generated a systematic self-understanding and we grasp all of our previous cultural and intellectual history. I want to show you how Hegel does this in a specific example. This, this translation between mythology and philosophy to create the new religion that is beyond right, all other religions. So let's think of the process by which understanding right, is moving to reason. And you can see that right, that's directly parallel to the process by which mythology is moving to philosophy. So let's get an example of a, of a very important mythological structure. Um, and of course I'm going to take Christianity because as I tried to show you, um, Hegel is secularizing Christianity in many ways. So you, Hegel argues that, right, let's put the myth on this side and then the, philo the philosophy on this side. Right? And we're going to see how we go from making sense of things to this self-realization, participating in the, the, the system that grasps the systematicity of this whole process. So you have the Father and the Trinity. Well, what does the Father represent? Well, the Father represents... Hegel would argue, understanding is undifferentiated, unarticulated, unactualized. Unarticulated, unactualized, right? undifferentiated. And then, of course, the idea is you get the incarnation in the sun. Sorry, that should be capitalized. I don't mean any disrespect. Right? Now, the incarnation is how our understanding starts to get differentiated into particular things. Here's a table. Here's a cup. Right? I'm here. The world's over there. We get all this articulation. So you get the beginning of right, articulation into particular things. And so you can see there's a sense in which right, the son is the counter, the antithesis of the father. Right? But then you get right, the, reconcil the reconciliation of the son to the father. You know, 
There's the son is sacrificed and the son reconciles with the father. And that, of course, is right that moment of higher integration. A higher new kind of identity is created. So this is this corresponds to the realization. Again, trying to pick up both meanings of this term. The realization of the identity indifference of the father and son. So the father and son are both different and one. And that's how understanding is now moving to this process where the integration and the differentiation are being brought together. Understanding is realizing that understanding is made out of differentiation and integration. And there's a kind of reconciliation, a higher order self-awareness that is taking place. And then we finally move down here, right, to the Holy Spirit. And of course, there's a bit of a pun intended because that's, you know, Geist is um, one way of translating spirit. And this is what? What did we see in the New Testament? We ult ultimately get the idea that God is agape. God is identical to the very process by which we are making each other into persons. And we don't individually possess agape in our minds. Agape is, agape is something we dwell within, a process of making sense and making persons, and making community of persons. And of course, what does the Holy Spirit corresponds to? Well, this is, the, right? this is Geist dwelling within its self-awareness. God has always been agape. We just didn't realize it. God is dwelling within the development of the community. This is what Hegel's doing. This is why Hegel has been called the Thomas Aquinas of Protestantism. He's doing, right, in Germany post the Protestant Reformation, what Aquinas was doing when, right, if you remember, when European thought, the systems of European thought encountered Aristotelian science. Hegel is now taking right, all of the machinery, right, the theological machinery that he sees at work in myth, and he is integrating it with the philosophical and scientific understanding that is impacting so powerfully on Europe in his time. He's trying to deal with how to restructure Christianity in light of the scientific revolution, the Protestant Reformation. And this is what he's doing. And he creates this powerful system. It's this just tremendously powerful system. It's grand synthesis. And that's important because Hegel felt and like I said, there's an element of hubris in here, but that his system exemplified what it was talking about. His philosophical system, in the way it provided a total, pay attention to that word, a total explanation of reality, mind, being, God, religion, philosophy, history. He thought it exemplified it, demonstrated it. And so German idealism was just massively influential because of this grand synthesis that it offered. But you can see what's going on here, right? You can see that this is a very powerful attempt to try and save the meaning-making machinery and salvage the axial legacy and somehow give us an account of, right, 
how we can still develop an increasing contact with reality in a way that is ultimately spiritual and rational at the same time. Hegel is in many ways a titanic figure trying to provide a powerful grammar, philosophical set of you know, concepts, conceptual vocabulary, and, 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 and theoretical, like, theoretical principles for structuring that vocabulary. He's trying to create a grammar by which we can deeply respond to the meaning crisis. So he's enormously popular. Um, and as I said, this, this form of German idealism spreads across Europe in very powerful ways, deeply influential. You'll even see figures within uh, America, like Josiah Royce, early on in the uh, intellectual history of America, deeply influenced by Hegel. So, why, why is this important? Well, Hegel is just going to have a profound impact on any future attempts to try and respond to the meaning crisis, just because of the way he's trying to synthesize everything together. But what's more important is, for many people, this form of idealism, German idealism, has completely collapsed. It doesn't, it's no longer considered a viable position. Now, I'm not here to argue about this at uh, sort of a, an abstract philosophical level, uh, I, right? Because, um, of course, there are many defenders of Hegel today. I want to take a look at what has happened, right, in the critical response to Hegel and how that has infused the development and the intensification of the meaning crisis. Remember, Hegel sets up this pattern of secularizing religion into systems of ideas that attempt to give us a total explanation and guide. He's the godfather, in this sense, of totalitarian ideologies. So, you have three main avenues of seeing a response. We already did one. The person who has a right, deep critique of Hegel is Schopenhauer. Because, and as you remember, Schopenhauer understands the relationship not the way Hegel does in terms of reason, Schopenhauer understands it in terms of will, the will to live, and then Nietzsche takes that up as the will to power, and he tries to use that as a way of recapturing right, self-transcendence. So we've already talked about that, so I'm not going to go over that again, but please remember it. Right? So the fact that the aspect of will, and the will to live, and the will to power wasn't adequately being addressed was what Schopenhauer points to. Okay, and then we have, of course, the tremendous critique of Kierkegaard. Right? Kierkegaard famously said, Hegel made a system and then sat down beside it. What's he, what's he pointing out here? There's an impersonalism. There's a lack of perspectival and participatory knowing in Hegel's whole proposal. It has been rendered into a system of ideas. All of this, right, all of this connectedness to reality, to ourselves and to each other, all of this process by which we cultivate wisdom and self-transcendence has been rendered into a system of beliefs, a system of ideas. Perspectival and participatory knowing have been lost. The only participation we have is in our understanding and appreciation of the Hegelian system. 
Now, what does that mean? Kierkegaard is pointing out, I believe, to the idea that this, our attempt to make contact with what's most real, our attempt to realize the divine, like in Platonic anagoge, and Plat Plato's dialectic was linked deeply to anagoge, has been completely severed from personal transformation and self-transcendence. You do not have to undergo any radical change. You do not have, ex have to have mystical experience. You do not have to have a higher state of consciousness. You do not have to have a encountered a Socratic challenge. Theology ha has become completely conceptual, propositional, rational self-reflection. It is not in any way engaged with projects of transformative experience. Westfall, in his book, Transcendence and Self-Transcendence, echoes this critique and points out that while Hegel is proposing this tremendous epistemic self-transcendence, we come to know how we know, he has lost the, the deep connection you saw in, right, in Plato to what Westfall, I'm not quite happy with this, calls, with this term, but he calls it like ethical self-transcendence. This is the process by which we become radically different. We overcome our egocentrism. We become more capable of agopic love. And Kierkegaard points out, I think quite correctly, that when we move through those transformative experiences, it requires what he would call a leap of faith. And this is a very dangerous concept, and I'm not going to try and defend it. But I think this makes sense, given what we've already seen in the work of L.A. Paul and others, that going through these transformative experiences is not something you can reason your way through. We exist before we have discovered this essence about who and what we are. That's the whole point of existentialism, as I mentioned. So what Kierkegaard is pointing out is that this system for all of its grandeur, is in a very deep sense like what Socrates found with the original natural philosophers. It is profound truths that have no existential transformative relevance. You cannot find in Hegel how to, cu how to cultivate wisdom. You can only find a theoretical structure for interpreting history. What about Marx? Marx is the other great critic of Hegel. And I hope you're seeing a pattern here. What's missing is the connection to will, right? Our, our participatory perspectival involvement. What's missing here is the connection to transformative experience, to ethical self-transcendence. What's missing here, according to Marx? Well, what Marx is basically arguing, again, Marx, I'm like, my God, you know, this, oh, the titanic things we're talking about here. And, 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 and there's, there's all these aspects of Marx I can't touch on, like his whole economic critique. And, 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 and that's not what I'm trying to do here. Marx is basically saying, right, that history is not driven by, think of Plato. Think of the man and the lion and the monster. History is not driven by reason by the man. History is driven by the monster. Right? It's driven by our socio-economic activity as we try to provide for our material existence. So Marx was of course deeply influenced also by Feuerbach, which means fire stream, which is a great name. And uh, Marx says, you can't understand me unless you have passed through the fire stream of Feuerbach's work. Feuerbach made this uh, proposal that religion, um, um, contra to Hegel, that religion is not the arena in which Geist has been unfolding itself and reality and intelligibility have been co-developing. Instead, he argues that religion is a projection, a term, of course, that Freud and Jung are going to pick up on. That when I'm thinking about God, what I'm actually doing is projecting an ideal model 
of my own humanity. And Feuerbach's idea is that this projection distorts, distracts us, deludes us, and it ultimately alienates human beings from their own role within historical processes. So Marx is going to take up this idea, this critique of religion, and he's going to see religion not as Hegel does, as you know, the, ve the, the vessel and vehicle in which Geist is unfolding itself. He's going to see religion as a noxious projection that is actually deluding people and distracting them from how they are the authors of history. So what Marx does is he says, okay, once we get rid of the religious distortion and we shift to the material monster, we see the dialectic at work there. The dialectic is a dialectical materialism, not a dialectical idealism. Right? So the clash is not between ideas that are contrasting and integrating. The clash is a process of political struggle between opposing ways of socioeconomic life. We have different classes, that's what a class is, a socioeconomic way of life, that oppose the, the idea of this distinction and articulation has been turned into one of conflict between these classes. But these classes are nevertheless systematically related. They are interdependent. They rely and define each other. So history is a di dialectic that is constantly through these clash, these conflict, the political struggle between the classes, is working out the self-contradictions in socioeconomic life. This is, what, this is the core of Marx's critique of capitalism, that it cont contains all these inherent self-contradictions. And that this process, this process of political struggle and violence, will work out the self-contradictions in our socioeconomic activity until we achieve a political state of peace and freedom, the promised land. Always the attempt to find the promised land. So what has Marx done? Do you see he's actually, in a sense, completing, I'm not trying to justify, I'm just saying you know, he's developing and bringing to a kind of logical conclusion the secularization implicit in Hegel. And he's supplying, I have criticisms of, uh, of this being an adequate solution, but this is what he sees himself doing. He sees himself supplying the missing, participa the missing participation that we don't have in Hegel. How do you participate in Hegel? Well, Marx says, this is how you participate. A call to arms, right? You know, the philosophers have only talked about the world, right? The communists want to change it. That's the communist manifesto, right? We, you know, workers of the world unite. We have nothing to lose but our chains. The idea is the, the, the dialectic and participation come together in the idea of political socioeconomic revolution. And you can also see elements of will here. Violent ideologies. Violent, totalizing ideologies that promise a secular utopia that is the culmination of the internal logic of history. So you have this deep politicalization of the process by which people are supposed to try and have faith, sense the course of history, Participate in the Kairos. Do you see, the Kairos of Christianity has become the revolution, the turning point in history that you have to participate in. You have to be on the right side. You have to help bring about the utopia. So these three critiques all push, this is of course pushing towards existentialism. This is a religious kind of existentialism. This through Nietzsche is pushing towards a, 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 an anti-religious existentialism. This, of course, is pushing towards Marxism.
But what they all share, right, is they share a sense that Hegel's totalizing ideology has not captured the core of human meaning making. We'll take a look at how this ramifies through Germany in the next episode. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you.